is Michelle, and today we've been reading Hocus Pocus Hotel, The Prisoners of the 13th Floor. And when we left off on Chapter 5 was where Cosette, Tyler, and Charlie went back to the Greek god statues. And Tyler told Cosette and Charlie, you know, just go on back. We'll take shifts. I'll stay here. Get me some food and bring it back and everything. And we'll take shifts and garden the statues and not letting Theophilus get to them because they, they think that that's what Theophilus, the evil magician, is up to. And he is creepy. He looks really smug and mean. So, anyway, let's start with Chapter 6, The Locked Door. Cosette handed Charlie her set of keys while she used her phone to call for help. The key's not working, Cosette, said Charlie. Tyler must have turned the door deadbolt, said Cosette. I don't see a keyhole for that. I hope someone comes soon, Charlie said. Annie and Rocky were the first to arrive. Rocky Brown was a teenage boy with long blonde hair who also worked at the front desk. Charlie quickly explained what had happened. Stand back, said Rocky. He rammed the door with his shoulder. It wouldn't give. That only works on TV, said Cosette. I just need a little more momentum, said Rocky. Now look out. I don't want you guys to get hurt. He took several steps back, drew in a deep breath, and then ran toward the door. His shoulder slammed into the wood like a linebacker tackling a tight end. The frame shattered, and splinters flew into the hall. I broke my shoulder, Rocky screamed. Charlie and Cosette beamed their flashlights into the darkness. Tyler, cried Annie. Just inside the room on the floor lay the motionless body of Tyler Yu. Could someone call a doctor, asked Rocky. He sat out in the hall holding his left shoulder. Then things became even more confusing. Over Rocky's groans and Annie's cries, Charlie heard some people arriving. Walter and Miranda Yu shoved their way to the door. Brack hobbled in on a cane. Theopolis and David Dragonstone, obviously alerted by the noises drifting up to their rooms through the, old, through the open ramp, joined the crowd. Charlie heard some of the hotel residents as well, ex-magicians and performers like Mr. Madagascar, Dottie Drake, and the reclusive juggler Mr. Thursday, who had just moved into the hotel the week before. And here they all are, and Charlie is standing over Tyler's motionless body. Can y'all see that? And that woman in the pink lay, or boa, looks like she is going to faint. All right. Charlie found himself in the room, kneeling over Tyler, although he didn't remember how he got there. And as he glanced up, he saw more and more onlookers stepping through the broken door frame and entering the dark room that had been unused for 50 years. That's a long time. Oh, my dear, is that Tyler? Is he alive? What are all these statues doing here? Oh, no, everybody knows about him now. What is this place? He's breathing, he's breathing. I think I'm going to faint. Do you think the floor is clean enough? That was Dottie Drake, at one time a famous magician's assistant. Her silver hair was swept up in a tall pile and she clutched her throat in terror. Oh, that poor boy, she said. The poor boy. I really do feel faint. Oh. <laughs> Everyone move back, yelled Miranda Yu. Even in an emergency, she looked cool and professional. And no fainting, she said. We don't have time for that. Someone call a doctor. The rest of you, wait outside. Out in the hall, the scene reminded Charlie of a dentist waiting room, except for the crying. Annie was sweeping, weeping softly as Dottie Drake hugged her. Rocky was weeping rather loudly. Theopolis stared at Charlie. Th Charlie stared at Theopolis, but the magician would not meet his gaze. I know he has something to do with this, thought Charlie, but I need evidence. How did he do it? How did he get into a locked room with Tyler when Cosette and I were standing right outside the door? And more importantly, how did he get back out? Wait! Charlie stood up. He grabbed his flashlight and headed back inside the room. Mrs. Yu was sitting on the floor, gently rubbing Tyler's back. Her head snapped up. Outside, Charlie, she snapped but I have to look at something. Out, she repeated. Charlie had learned early on not to mess with Mrs. Yu. They all meant business. It's each in their own way. 
He stood up for a moment, gripping his flashlight, not saying a word. He simply looked at Tyler's motionless body. He had never seen the boy so quiet and so vulnerable. It was like looking at a fallen soldier. Above Tyler's body stood the statue of Ares with his outstretched sword. Then Charlie turned out and walked, turned and walked out, just as the ambulance team was hurrying in with their bags and a stretcher. Chapter 7. No Way Out Once Tyler and Rocky had been taken away on stretchers by the EMTs, the hallway emptied very quickly. A half hour later, the last ones remaining were Charlie, Brack, and Mr. Yu, who frowned, examining the splintered doorframe. I can't leave it like this, he muttered. What a terrible accident. I don't believe it was an accident at all, said Brack. Do you still have your flashlight, Charlie? Charlie nodded. He didn't need a, to hear another word from the old magician. He turned on his light and stepped into the room. Back and forth, he swung the flashlight's beam. It was a single open room, a large hotel room with an, only ancient gods and spider webs for guests. He saw the statues. He saw the door to the bathroom that Brack and Tyler had both used. He saw a few pieces of old furniture. He saw an open space that was probably supposed to have been a closet, but never had a door attached to it. The one thing that Charlie did not see in the glare of his flashlight, another door or window. Do you see what's missing, whispered Brack? Yes, yeah, said Charlie. No way out. That's not what I meant, said Brack. Something else. Charlie swung the light some more. What else was not there that should have been? Did Brack mean? No, it was impossible. Charlie used the flashlight as a spotlight on each of the twelve. Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Ares, Hermes, Apollo, Athena, Hades, Artemis, Demeter, Hephaestus, and... Where was the beautiful woman holding the apple? He counted them a second. Aphrodite is missing, Charlie said. But, Brack, how could that be? I saw Aphrodite when we first came in to get you. I saw her too, Charlie, he replied. But someone got to her. Charlie shut his eyes. He tried to think back. When he first entered the room, he had seen all of the twelve, even if he saw only a few out of the corner of his eye. He could count all of them. And then he pictured the second time he came back with Ty and Cosette. He remembered how crowded it had felt, walking through the forest of frozen figures in the stuffy old room. But yes, he had counted them too. There had been twelve gods and goddesses of stone. He was sure of it. They sometimes seemed to twitch and blink in the moving beams of light from the flashlights and Cosette's phone. The muscles in their fingers flexed, the veins in their neck pulsed. But there had been twelve. Where was the goddess of beauty? She couldn't walk out on her carved stone feet. And here they are. And they're shining their light, Brack and Charlie, on the goddesses. And um, Aphrodite is missing. I bet we know who took it. Or could she? Maybe that sculptor Ernesto Andriago was a magician after all. Maybe he possessed some genius skill for building stone figures that moved on their own. But that still didn't solve the bigger mystery. How did Ty's attacker and the goddess Aphrodite leave the room while it was locked from the inside? And why Charlie and Cosette stood guard outside? My stupid ankle, cried Brack. If only I hadn't heard it, this wouldn't have happened. That statue would still be here. You don't think it was alive too, do you? Whispered Charlie, but Brack didn't answer. He just stared at the statues. Mr. Yu was standing outside by the broken door frame. Charlie could hear him on his phone trying to get a carpenter and a locksmith to the hotel as quickly as possible. Then he heard him talking to his wife, telling her that he would soon join her at the hospital. You don't, do you, repeated Charlie. Think it was alive? A stone-cold shiver ran down Charlie's spine. The air in the dark room grew darker. He thought the statues were shuffling closer. Brack smiled. Magic can always be explained, he said. You've proven that before, Master Hitchcock, time and time again. And this can be explained, too. I know that you'll solve this mystery just as you have the others. I'm not sure about that, thought Charlie. He looked, looked into Brack's eyes, and the feeling that the statues crowded in on him faded away. But his doubts remained. 
there was only one thing he was sure about. He couldn't let his friends down. All right. Chapter 8 is next. Hold on. Let me see how long it is because, yeah, I'll run out of time. So next I'll read Chapter 8, The Third Flower. All right.